Merci à M. le vice-recteur, M. le directeur, chers, chers étudiants, chers amis, chers collègues. D'abord, quelques mots en français, euh, mais je vais continuer en anglais. Euh, je veux vous remercier pour cette invitation. C'est vrai, c'est mon dernier jour euh, à l'étranger comme euh, vice-recteur général. Et pour moi, c'est revenir à la maison, euh, revenir à Genève. J'ai passé beaucoup de temps ici comme sous-secrétaire général pour les affaires humanitaires. Et j'ai aussi fait des négociations entre Iran et Irak pendant des mois ici à Genève. Et je vous félicite d'avoir choisi l'Université de Genève comme la place de vos études avec cette réputation très, 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 très bonne d'être une université vraiment internationale. Euh, vous avez fait le bon choix et je vais vous féliciter. Monsieur Meller m'a dit que vous avez un, un caractère très international, mais aussi très pratique. Vous avez évidemment des, des interprètes qui, vous, qui, vous, qui sont prêts à travailler dans des camps de réfugiés, mais comme un exemple d'un programme très pratique pour nous. So, by these words, um, thank you very much again for inviting me. I have a 12-page uh, written speech. Hmm. It will be uh, put on the website <laughs> as prepared. <laughs> Rebecca Page, my special assistant, has agreed. That's the way we will do it. And Michael Muller has advised me very strongly rather to speak freely and uh, personally. Uh, since this is at the end of my term, and I have no career to worry about anymore. <laughs> Uh, and uh, still I stand by every word which is in this speech. You may, uh, for academic reasons, compare the two and see how they depart from each other. Uh, I think I would like to start with the, uh, a little bit of an overview as I see the world as it is now. And it's not a pretty place, as you know. But in order to not end you entering deep depression, I promise you that at the end of my lecture, I will give you reasons for hope, <laughs> especially with the introduction given by the vice rector here, <laughs> of connecting the international to the domestic developments in certain countries. Um, and then I will proceed to, um, after this expose uh, of the world as it is, I will also <laughs> slowly enter the area of the world as it should be. Because I think our job is to both analyze the world as it is, but never forget the word as it should be. And our job is, all of us, is to diminish the gap between the word as it is and the word as it should be. So that I will do by talking about the three pillars of the UN, uh, peace and security, development, and human rights. And then uh, we'll see how I end. But it will be with an expression of hope also. And by the way, you are part of that hope. So, the world that we live in today, it's almost a banality to say. It's a world of uh, uncertainty. It's a world of uh, turmoil and turbulence. And um, I would say uh, new and complicating factors uh, that affect world development. We have um, horrible conflicts going on. The worst one, in my view, is, of course, the war in Syria where I must admit failure of the international community and of those involved on the ground also, particularly the parties that can decide whether the war will continue. Um, and that I unfortunately don't see much of an open, an open opening. Like your mother showed me the news report just today and it's just bad news, bad news, bad news from Aleppo and all over. Um, we also have on the development side growing inequalities. Not so much between nations, although that is very much the case, uh, but we knew that all along. But I think more damaging is the growing inequalities inside nations. And if you want to analyze election results in different parts of the world, I think you cannot avoid looking at that issue to what degree people feel that globalization, the market economy, really produces what they expect with their families, especially since they now know, also thanks to these little things that you have in your pockets, <laughs> what's going on and what is achieved and what exists outside your own borders. 
I also, on this bad news side, find it extremely disturbing to see the growing disregard, neglect, um, even decay of um, understanding for international human rights law and actually human rights also. Uh, it is striking to what degree um, Geneva Conventions uh, bodies, conventions that are well known, Refugee Convention of 1951, are no longer known not to speak about completely disregarded. Yesterday I had the statistics of five hospitals being hit, as it seemed intentionally, around Aleppo. Today I saw the figure is eight. We have the same happening in Yemen, happened in Afghanistan, and um, to me it's absolutely unacceptable. The sign of huge deterioration of values that we see this decay of international term law and human rights. And I say this intentionally strongly in Switzerland and in Geneva, where you are really in the center of those efforts of standing up for human rights and humanitarian law. And I, whatever we and you can do to spread that knowledge would be great. I was the first uh, Under Secretary of Humanitarian Affairs, and I know pretty well the Geneva Conventions. And I came, went to the Security Council two years ago to discuss the Syria solution, which dealt with human channel access. And I found it astonishing that I had to tell members of the Security Council that what they actually were negotiating were formulations that are given in the Geneva Conventions. Can you imagine having a variety of the Geneva Conventions and the Security Council resolution? And it struck me then that the lack of knowledge goes even higher. So whatever you can do to increase that knowledge of your dad law and to raise your voices about this absolutely unacceptable development. Bombing a hospital is a war crime. And we have to protect civilians. Going after civilian targets are war crimes. So that, that's the bad news side. That's why I warned you from the beginning. There will be hope in the end. Mm. Uh, let me then move to the uh, methods of work. The, uh, three pillars that I think United Nations work must stand on. But these three pillars are equally valid for every nation. Every nation needs to have a balance between peace and security, development, and human rights. And I would claim, after years of experience, that if one of these pillars is weak and shaky, then the whole structure is weak. So in other words, there is no peace without development. But there is no development without peace, and there is none of development without respect of human rights, rule of law. And uh, by the way, also, good governments and strong institutions. On the peace and security uh, pillar, the biggest wound is, uh, of course, Syria, that I already mentioned, with all its ramifications of revenue neighboring countries, uh, the tremendous suffering inside the country, first of all, but then also now the effects of migration and refugees on political life, <coughs> not least in Europe, changing the whole political map in many European countries, and probably also the United States in the recent election. Uh, there are also other horror stories in that area, South Sudan, which grows more and more tribal, and uh, where I think we have to watch out for something very dangerous, and I want you all to be very aware of this growing role of ethnic politics, religious politics, tribal politics. That when the fear factor is working in our world, people look for the outside as the problem, as even the enemy. In fact, the outside, in terms of migration, for instance, is much more of a potential and possibility, and much less of a peril. If you look at the effects on economic growth or population growth, migrants are absolutely necessary. They might have minus growth. Uh, and as you know, migration uh, feeds uh, remittances. Uh, there are 244 million uh, migrants in the world, people who work and live in countries where they're not born. These remittances are three times practically 
the size of all official development systems. But the tendency to divide societies into us and them, putting a quality level of us and them, here is the us and then here is the them, them, is one of the most dangerous trends in the world today, a poison in the body politic internationally and nationally. Okay. The hopeful sign, if I now move a little bit to the uh, what we can do about things is that there have been growing interest uh, and trends in the direction of realizing the importance of prevention. Prevention has been a word in the lofty speeches for many, many years, but it's now time for us to be very hands-on and analyze how we can act on the early stages. Whether it is a conflict, or whether it's a drought that lately could lead to rising food prices, or whether it's human rights violations that can lead to atrocities. I always carry the UN Charter in the pocket. Uh, this is my 12th copy since 1980. Uh, and I carry it intentionally because there are so many occasions for me to remind people of the Charter. And when I meet Security Council members, I challenge them somewhat and say, Do you know? that in the first chapter and in the first paragraph of the UN Charter, prevention is requested. I don't know whether they lie or whether they tell the truth, that they know it, but I sometimes just reread it to what it says. The purpose of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security. And to that end, to take effective collective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to the peace. What is a threat? It's before it's happened, isn't it? And then you move to chapter six, one of the underutilized chapters of UN. Specific settlement of disputes. Article 33 says the following. The parties to any dispute shall first of all seek a solution by, count on your fingers what you should do before a conflict. Negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to agencies, or arrangements or of other peaceful means of their own choice. Eight different levels. My profession is diplomacy. I'm not there to fight wars or even do peacekeeping. I'm there to prevent things from happening. This is our job. This is going to be your job, many of you. And this is what we need to go the direction of prevention. Second pillar development. I think I'm going to raise your spirit on this one. Because if you look back at last year, 2015, it was the best year that I can recall <coughs> for a new conceptual way of thinking of development. I was around already at the Millennium Development Goals 15, 16 years ago now. It was mostly a discussion about efficient development systems and the relationship between donors and recipients. Today, that's passé, that type of thinking. See, the new way of looking at development is, first of all, we are all bound by these sustainable goals that we agreed upon in September. They are universal because they basically deal about sustainability, to save life on this planet. By the way, you may have plan B in your life, don't you? Plan B? But I say one thing, there's no planet B. There's no planet B. And this uh, the existential strand of thought is the basis of the SDGs. By the way, they are also then combining with the Climate Agreement in Paris. So the combination of the SDGs and the Climate Agreement in Paris is our basis for an action plan in all nations and in the world to bring about full sustainability. But also what is beautiful about these goals is that they are interrelated and mutually reinforcing. I have worked very much with water. Let's imagine a glass of water here. Mm. This is a dream, a glass of water. An absolutely an unattainable dream for about 800 million people in the world. And 800 children die every day because of lack of water. Well, if you do this right, water and sanitation right, you get immediate effects of child mortality, Maternal health, education, mostly girls and women who otherwise pay the price, gender equality by that, of course, 
and extreme poverty. So the old MDT is five of eight goals are affected by clean water and sanitation. Same thing with the new SDGs. How health, the health cluster, the fire six goals there, the education, education also, fire six goals around education. And you can go across the field and see that this is now very, very much becoming a, a tool of economic and social planning. I've been to so many countries only, only this year and seen how these goals are now part of economic planning. And that's the whole idea. We are not there at the UN to just you know, produce resolutions. We want to have a basis for work that permeates the nation states and in the end re reaches the people. The first three words, by the way, are these this charter is we the peoples. Our accountability is we the peoples. Do we really produce peace? Do we produce decent life? Do we produce human rights? That's our job. So, uh, on the SDGs and the climate change, there have been great steps forward. And I think if now member states live up to these declarations, translate that to their national planning, I think we are in much better shape. Could be in better shape. Great potential in that. Human rights is the third pillar. It's a pillar that has reached, has, has received only a fraction of the money in the UN budget. I think 3% of our budget is going to that whole field. And what we wanted with an initiative that the Secretary of Ban Ki moon asked me to uh, drive is called Human Rights Upfront, was to raise the level of human rights that that job said earlier, without human rights, no peace, no development, and that everyone in the UN should be aware of the human rights dimension. And the fact that this is delivering to the people is what it's all about. But I have been mediating, I think, in six different conflicts. And when I analyze the, how the conflicts evolve, I very easily came to the conclusion that very often it was human rights violation, which was the first sign the vibrations in the ground. The vibrations in the ground. The father is tortured. The children don't go to school because of their ethnic background, religious background. Journalists cannot print what they want. Civil society is kept back. That's where the very warning signals come. And I asked myself rhetorically, and I asked also externally this question. If human rights violations is the first sign of conflicts to come, why don't we then act at that stage rather than waiting for mass atrocities to occur? This is the life of a conflict. And sometimes Security Council even has the same definition of <coughs> conflict as CNN. Namely, when houses are burning, children are dying, we have to mobilize for a huge humanitarian program or send out peacekeepers. But in fact, our job is to see this life of a conflict and act on the preventive stage and then act also on the post-conflict stage so that it doesn't happen again by development measures, by setting up institutions, and of course, having reconciliation processes so that it doesn't happen again. There are statistics that prove that from the conflicts of the 80s and 90s, 50% uh, broke out or, or at least were close to breaking out because there was not enough work done afterwards. Examples being Afghanistan, Michael, and Somalia. Just as we know, still our problems because there wasn't enough. After we <laughs> it was over, everybody left. Nobody was really internally or externally dealing with the basic issues. So uh, on human rights, we are very happy to see this initiative. I can tell you very openly that it's not uh, completely popular in every uh, corner mm. of the world, mm. because member states sometimes don't like to be reminded that something inside their own country could turn into a civil war. But if the logic of this in my book is that not only is it very much damaging to a great number of people inside that country, but it is also growing the risk not only of civil war, or civil strife at least, but the trend today 
which makes it so important to bring this out from the perspective of international peace and security, is that these conflicts now easily and more and more turn into proxy wars. In other words, outside actors who play out their interests inside other countries. When I mediated in the Darfur conflict, in order to get the parties to the table, I didn't have to go all around Darfur or Sudan. No, I had to go to Chad, Libya, Egypt, and Eritrea in order to get those member states to push their friends to go to the table. And the worst example is, of course, Syria. The reason I'm pessimistic about Syria is that we can't have peace in Syria unless you have agreement between people on the highest level, on the P5 level, Program 5, in particular US and Russia. But you also need to have the regional actors come to the conclusion that this war must end, to speak very openly. You will not be able to have that unless Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar are on board. And then you have, of course, to understand that the parties become more and more dispersed, split, as long as the war goes on. If we had agreed on a Security Council resolution in 2012, which had been a possibility after Kofi Annan's negotiations in June, but if we had had that resolution, you would have had a completely different history. By the way, ISIS did not even exist in the summer of 2012, at least not in Syria. So here we are, these are the three pillars, these are the three tools we have, and I believe very much that these are the ones we have to make even stronger. Now, if I were, I'd have to keep my promise of the hope factors. And my, oh, is someone protesting? I'm not doing that. Because I was going to say, it just fell down. This is someone against my first point. My first point is that this period in history, the next two decades, and now I'm not trying to ingratiate myself with half of the students here today. The next two, two decades, in my view, in my provision, and I hope to, hope to live to experience it, is going to be the age, the time of full empowerment of women for the first time in history. For the first time in history, it's coming. I see it all over. The trend is so clear all over the world. My own country, I was foreign minister. We have had 50% women in every government, 48% of the parliament women. Rwanda beats us, they have 64% women. <laughs> you men will be in a minority soon. Uh, you have uh, women moving into trade and politics all over. I think the private sector is a bit slow, but I think it's coming. And I had the privilege of working for a Swedish Prime Minister, Olof Palme, who reminded me of why it has to be uh, supported by all. Uh, because he said when someone came to him with a speech with a rather uh, simple, simplistic uh, title, namely the importance of the uh, emancipation of women, and he looked at it and said, first of all, this is a very boring title for this speech. Secondly, you haven't understood what this is all about. Everyone looked at him and Olaf Palm said, change immediately this into the importance of the emancipation of man. This is the business of men and women to make this happen. It would have a tremendous effect in terms of finally really drawing conclusions of everybody's equal value and worth, worth for society, but also with enormous social and economic effects for society. And I think women in decision making also is very healthy. I've seen it in the resolution 3025 work. Unfortunately, it takes far too long to make it happen, but it will happen. So women is the first piece of good news. The second one is youth, you also. Um, even if people are so worried that we are all about youth unemployment. You want to know that you get a job after studying here, I'm sure. And I feel sorry that so many of you have to try hard to get even into an internship at the UN. But I feel very strongly, I was a professor at Uppsala University after I left as foreign minister, and it was just uh, wonderful. My wife claimed that I looked younger for every month I was at Uppsala. <laughs> 
But I also think that we should change concept. I think we should not only think in terms of what we can do for youth. I think we should change the concept of what we can do with youth. It is with youth that we can discuss education, training, job security, unemployment, new ideas of entrepreneurship, how to live up to all these ambitions we have. I have learned more from my 10-year-old grandchild, Agnes, about how to use this one. <laughs> every time I come back to Sweden, I'm commuting here, I'm trying to get back there now and then. She teaches me something in 15 seconds that I didn't know I could. <laughs> here I am. This is just a symbol of what I say. You can do so much, and you should insist on coming in. And we, on our side, should see to it that we are, have you on our side. And this goes particularly for our organization in the United Nations. The third is also related to your life. The third reason for hope is knowledge, science, technology. My wife was Deputy Minister of Education in Sweden. She reminded me all the time of this fact. That, oh, come on, these SDGs, you will not be able to make them without, without getting science in on health, without getting science in on climate. And we need so much that knowledge factor. And I, therefore, your studies here are extremely important. And science, knowledge, technology can't really make changes possible. And my last element of hope is, of course, international cooperation. And I would say also United Nations. With all its weaknesses, if I look at the failure in Syria, if I look at peacekeeping operations, we have sexual exploitation abuse, all kinds of problems, we're not protecting civilians as protecting civilians as we should, but still it's the best possible venue to send the message that we are in this world together. And here is something very serious that before the Vice Rector's introduction. I think we all have now a duty to show that open borders, open contacts across countries and peoples are absolutely essential for our societies for the future. Because right now there is a tension between uh, what I would call liberal internationalism and uh, populist nationalism. And I think we need to see and make the case that the international approach, the fact that we are all part of the world, is something that we can convince people in our world about. Our voters, our people out there in the farms, in the villages, in the suburbs, we must be able to send a more positive narrative about the world, uh, which is a world which is irresistibly international. If you look at issues like climate change or migration, it's intellectually, logically impossible to find a national solution, is it, to climate change or a national solution to migration and refugee challenges? It's by definition impossible, Professor, isn't it? <laughs> but don't you then come to the conclusion that it has to be a negotiated international solution? Paris Agreement, SDGs, whatever. And then isn't, isn't it then the logical conclusion that that negotiated international solution in today's world is in the national interest? Can you imagine the day coming when the good international solution is seen as a national I had the honor of speaking on the National Day in Sweden 30 years ago, and the title given to me by the um, organizers was Sweden in the World. Ah, I spoke about Dag Hammarskjöld, I spoke about Raoul Wallenberg, I spoke about Olaf Palme, everybody applauded. And then I made a little pause and said, but this is only half the story. It's not, it's not only Sweden in the world, it's also something which is with the world in Sweden. And if you look at your own countries, Switzerland or the hundred countries or so that you represent in this great university, it is you in the world, but it's also the world in your own country. And that we should understand that the nation state builds on the strength and beauty of diversity. So I really wish you all the best in the work, in your studies. I give you the hope, both you as women and you as young, and you as now achieving more knowledge. And I hope that you will be advocates for that better narrative for the world outside, also coming inside our nations. We cannot simplify it. We cannot the Don Quixote wise flag, the wave the flag of internationalism.
we have to understand it, we have to come under the skin and make this a reality, a show and prove that cooperation across borders, getting impulses from others, listening to others, learning from the outside is part of creating a more mature, peaceful society and a society which can <coughs> prosper and also in the end develop lives in, in dignity for all, which must be the ultimate objective of our time. So by this, I thank you, and then I offer you a little bit of a, a study on comparing this speech to the speech that we will post on the website soon. Uh, and uh, I hope there are some similarities. Uh, Rebecca will be the judge for that. But thank you for your attention, and all the best to you. Good